Thank you. Well, hello everyone and welcome to our program. Tonight we'll be exploring Fire Island Sunken Forest with Park Ranger Pat Riley. Pat Riley has been with the Fire Island National Seashore for seven years after careers in the U.S. Navy and as a teacher and she has a degree in biology. Um, we're excited to have this presentation with you. My name is Tara Moran. I'm a librarian at Massac which is Shirley Community Library. And uh, during this presentation that Pat is doing, you'll remain muted. But of course, we welcome all of your questions um, and we can answer them as, as we go. Pat will be answering them. So be sure to put mm -hmm. them right in that chat feature and um, she'll see it and, and I'll see it and I can um, send your questions to her. So we'll answer along the way. So with that, why don't we get started and let Pat show us all about the sunken forest. Okay, so um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, thank you to the library for hosting this. Um, we're gonna sort of do a virtual tour of the sunken forest. This is what I've tried to set up here with my PowerPoint. And uh, so a, like a virtual field trip. And I hope that it will inspire you to visit in person. Um, we don't know yet when the, um, the ferries are gonna start running, when we're gonna open our um, visitor centers, but um, probably end of May, beginning of June, you can keep an eye on the website, the Fire Island National Seashore website, or um, even the ferry schedules to go to the Savile Ferry schedule. Um, so let's get started. First, Fire Island National Seashore. Um, Fire Island, as most of you probably know, is located off the south shore of Long Island. It is 32 miles long and less than a mile wide. Um, also part of Fire Island National Seashore is the William Floyd Estate in Mastic Beach. So Fire Island is one of 10 national seashores and that we are up to 423 national park units at this point. Um, Fire Island was established in 1964 in response to uh, a couple of issues. One of them was that Robert Moses, the great builder and architect of New York parks, wanted to put a highway um, down um, Fire Island from Ocean Parkway, continue it all the way to Hamptons. Uh, the residents of Fire Island were against this and they actually turned over the sunken forest to the care of Fire Island in order to sort of stop this plan for a highway. So Sunken Forest was really important in the establishment um, of Fire Island National Seashore. So here's a map. I'm gonna try to turn my pointer on. So, um, so over here, I'm pointing to our Wilderness Visitor Center. And you can see that's at the end of William Floyd Parkway right over the bridge at Smith Point. And this visitor center is open year round on weekends. Um, again, look at our website, check out the programs we have going on all, all year round. Um, the William Floyd Estate is over here. Um, everybody's video is going to block in my pointer, but it's over that way. Um, Watch Hill is accessed via Patchogue. Um, Sunken Forest and Sailor's Haven are over here reached by the Sable Ferry. And it's right about in the middle of Fire Island. So if we keep going west, the lighthouse is at the western end. And Fire Island itself actually goes about another six miles, which was Robert Moses State Park, um, which you reach over the Robert Moses Causeway. And the lighthouse is also um, open year round. So we have marinas on here, um, very few vehicles. If you've never been to Fire Island, it's, that's one of the things that people have a hard time wrapping their head around that there, um, there aren't, aren't any vehicles. So how do you get here? Well, you'll probably arrive by ferry. So Sable Ferry runs seasonally. Um, Cherry Grove, which is less than a mile away, is a year round ferry. So you can go, the park is open year round. You are welcome to go and walk through the forest on your own. Um, when you come in the summertime, we'll have the visitor center open. You can get maps, have your questions answered. 
Last year with COVID, we were not allowed to do um, guided tours. It was sort of go, in, go on a self-guided tour. We don't really know what it's gonna look like this year. Um, we'll see, but Sayville Ferry, you can Google it to find the, um, the uh, ferry schedule. So, let me advance this. So, the Sunken Forest is a globally rare maritime holly forest. There are only two forests like this, this particular group of plants that makes up this ecosystem. There's only two in the world. And question for you guys, anybody know where the other one is? You can put it in the chat. Sandy Hook, is Sandy Hook, New Jersey? Yes, indeed. Very good. So Sandy Hook, New Jersey, is, there's also a maritime holly forest. And we're going to look at some of the things that make it so special. So this cross section of the island helps us to understand, is it really sunken? Um, the forest is not really sunken. It is lower than the level of the dunes. So when you walk under the canopy, and we're gonna see some pictures, and if you've been there before, you know what this feels like. It feels like you're going under something, but you're not going underground or under the sea, uh, below sea level. And what makes this possible is that Fire Island is wide enough at this point to have two dunes. So lots of spots. If you go to Fire Island, a lot of times where the communities are, there's one dune, and then there's the behind the dune area. But here um, near Sailor's Haven, there's, it's wide enough to have this primary dune, which is the one that faces the ocean. This is the, uh, the dune that is very, very dynamic. It changes with storms, gets blown away, washed away, builds up. The plants are pioneer plants. Beach grass is what helps hold the dune together with its roots. And in, where it's wide enough, the secondary dune is a much older dune. The plants have been established long enough that the rotting vegetation has created a thin layer of soil and we can actually have trees. So there's an area in between, it's called the swale. I'm gonna describe that a little as we go along, uh, but it's, um, it's sort of hot. It, it reflects the sun from the dunes on both sides. But you can see if you walk into the forest over here, you're going underneath the canopy of trees. And we're going to talk about how that works. So the secondary dune. This is, if the primary dune is maybe hundreds of years old, the secondary dune is thousands of years old. And if you look at this photo, you can see the dune behind the people where the ranger's sort of looking in that direction. The ground goes up. Uh, we have trees here. Um, the trees also don't grow straight in the sunken forest. And here's another question. Does anybody know why they don't just go straight up? Any guesses? All right, I'll tell you. <laughs> um, we have something called salt spray pruning. If we were to go back to this diagram, when the spray comes from the ocean, it's, it's salty, it's got other minerals, potassium, sodium, so on. They're actually good nutrients for the soil. Um, but the dune blocks the main force of it. And if you notice that the, the plants seem to be shaved right off, they are. And this is called salt spray pruning. And that pruning will, um, will stop the, gro the growth that's vertical and they have more horizontal growth. And you get this sort of twisted, um, almost like bonsai underneath the canopy. And here's a great spot that we always stop on the tour to look at the salt spray pruning, how it's trimmed this shrubbery. It crosses the boardwalk, but it looks almost like someone's taken a pair of scissors to it and, and uh, trimmed that down. And this is 100% from the, the salt spray. Um, the, the leaves and twigs and, and shoots that try to get higher than that are, are damaged by the salt and they can't grow any higher. So when you're in the boardwalk, uh, on the boardwalk trail, you'll see it goes between these trees. Um, there's not a whole lot of undergrowth. Um, most of it is shaded. 
Um, so the trees are sort of get up and put all their energy into the canopy uh, where they're getting the sunlight in order to grow. So let's look at some of the trees we're gonna find here. So American holly is the first one. And this is um, sort of the typical, it's a holly forest. And interesting things, the holly leaves, um, if you look at that picture on the right, you probably recognize holly from holiday decorations. The leaves are waxy and they have these spikes on them. And uh, this helps protect them from the salt spray and also from being browsed by animals, deer and rabbits. Um, if you notice, I've sort of done a close up there of that one uh, tree trunk and it's got these, looks like eyes. And it's really neat when you go into the forest you see these circular patterns and what they are are limb scars. So as the tree grows and um, limbs are growing higher, closer to the canopy that are efficiently capturing sunlight, the branches that are lower down that are not efficiently capturing sunlight, the tree actually can shut off circulation and these limbs drop off. And this is called self pruning um and it leaves these limb scars the um the tree actually sh can shut off the nutrients going uh to this branch and cause it to fall off the red berries are uh classic you see them only on the female trees so this is a really interesting thing if you go to the sunken forest in the springtime and you get if you're lucky enough to see everything in bloom the holly trees the male and female trees have flowers but they're just ever so slightly different. The flowers are tiny. You see how the size of the berries, each flower is smaller than that berry, but the berries only develop on those uh, female trees. So, Some of the oldest trees in the forest are in this grove. So when we take our, our, our real field trip or our virtual trip, we have this deck and we call it the heart of the forest. It's not the geographic center but it's probably the oldest trees in the forest. Most of them are hollies there. Um, any guesses as to how old or anybody? Um, Ryan and Brad knew that it, the other forest was in Sandy Hook. Do you know how old these trees are? I, maybe, I don't know, three, 400 years? You're very close. We estimate them between two and 300 years old, but they're not huge trees. The trunks are maybe 12 to 18 inches across. Um, but they're mature trees. They're not going to get any much bigger than this. Uh, and it's considered um, a virgin forest, which means it's never been cut to, to harvest the wood. It's also a climax forest. So they, these trees won't be replaced by other trees. So another classic tree, and if I go back, if you look at this sort of orangey, rusty brown tree trunk. Um, that is a sassafras tree. So um, this is another of the very classic maritime forest trees, one of the part of this ecosystem. And um, it's, it's remarkable because its leaves have three different shapes to them. So if you notice, um, there's a leaf that's sort of just leaf shaped, and then there's a mitten. So you see this one, it's got two lobes. And then there's these other ones with three lobes. And they actually, there's some with five lobes, um, which are unusual, but this is a sassafras tree. This is what the leaves look like. Um, if you were to crunch up a leaf, um, it smells sort of lemony, citrusy. Um, kids who come to the forest who don't really have a huge spectrum of ways to describe smells, say that it smells like Fruit Loops. And once you hear that, it does. It smells just like Fruit Loops. And um, sassafras, if you can recognize the word sarsaparilla, um, the original root beer or sarsaparilla was made from the roots of the sassafras tree. Uh, it's not anymore. And um, the leaves are dried sometimes. If you have, uh, are into cooking, Cajun cooking, the spice filet is made from uh, dried ground uh, sassafras leaves. So here's another tree um, that we're gonna see in the forest. It's very, very common, it's everywhere. Um, Juneberry is the, the easiest 
word to say. It's June berry. The berries come out in June. Amelanchier is the sort of botanical name. It's also known as service berry um, because back in colonial times, when this plant flowered, they knew that probably the, the ground was going to be um, thawed enough for them to dig graves and hold funeral services for anybody who might have died over the winter. So, I mean, this is sort of something we don't think about today, but um, without mechanical digging tools, somebody had to be out there with a shovel and they had to wait till spring. So service berry showed people, okay, this is flowering now and the ground is probably soft enough um, to hold services. And shad bush refers to the river herring, also called shad, which um, when the shad bush was blooming, you could go out and catch the river herring. They sort of coincide in terms of uh, season and time. So um, thus its name. So lots of times, when we see these trees, we might see a set of holes in them. Um, the holes are, they don't kill the tree, they're sort of linear. Um, a lot of people don't know, any guesses, anybody really know or have a wild guess as to what it could be? A woodpecker? It is a woodpecker. And it, it's a very particular woodpecker called a yellow-bellied sapsucker. So this picture I took in my front yard because I'd never seen one in the forest before. Um, but there was one out drilling in a maple tree in my front yard. So this is a yellow-bellied sapsucker. Um, the coloring isn't great. It's not the greatest photo to see that it does have a little bit of a yellow on its belly. Um, but they, their food source is the sap and also the insects they find under the bark. So. Those three trees um, that we've talked about are pretty much um, this, the Juneberry, the uh, Sassafras, and the Holly are the main trees we see. We also have some oak trees in there and maples, and they, they don't grow straight either, which is really interesting. So um, the understory, there's a lot of um, shrubbery, shrubs, um, vines, down, lower, down. And um, the first picture here on the left is a cat briar. There's loads of vines in the forest. Um, we don't have all day <laughs> to look at every single plant in the forest, but cat briar is a very common one. Um, other vines we see are Virginia creeper, um, wild grapes. The picture in the center is wild cherry. And this is very common. And you think of a cherry tree as growing straight up and they do grow bigger. They do grow into trees, but much of the under, understory is, um, is this wild cherry. And um, the deer don't eat it. And this is one of the reasons why it's still so prevalent. Uh, any idea why the deer don't eat it? Anybody have any idea? They or poison. Go ahead. Poisonous? It is mildly poisonous. It doesn't taste good. Um, it, the wild cherry and black cherry and apple are in the same family. And did you ever bite into an apple seed? It's got cyanide in it. Not a lot, but the leaves of the black cherry or wild cherry also have cyanide in, in it. It probably, if you ate a lot, it, you might get sick. Um, but the deer don't like it just because of the taste. So much of the underbrush uh, is wild cherry. And another reason why it's mostly wild cherry is that the deer browse everything else. And um, the, the forest is, is sort of at a critical point because there's no saplings. The holly trees are not coming back. As these mature trees die off, um, there, are, there aren't any saplings because the deer have browsed them all. And then the third picture there is uh, a very common plant. If you don't know it, you should learn it before you come to Fire Island. It's poison ivy. Poison ivy is pretty much everywhere. Um, and uh, 
the leaves, the, the, this shows actual little flowers on it. It has berries and uh, roots, stems, everything contains this toxin that causes that itchy rash. So um, we always advise somebody, if you're on a real tour, not a virtual tour, stay on the boardwalk because the, um, the poison ivy is pretty much everywhere. So part of the forest is interesting. We have a freshwater bog. Um, we know it's freshwater, and this is sort of a fall winter photo, and it's hard to see exactly what's there. Um, but you might look down off the boardwalk and see ferns growing. If you see a fern, ferns don't grow in salt water or brackish water. So you'd know this was a freshwater bog. Um, we have cattails and phragmites, which are sort of reeds. And let's take a look at those. Um, the uh, cattail's the one on the left. And it's pretty distinctive. It has these brown seed heads on it. They're sort of the size of a cigar or a hot dog. Um, when I was a kid, we used to call them punks. We used to light them on fire to keep the mosquitoes away. Don't know if it really worked, but they smell kind of good. And on the right is Phragmites. So Phragmites is very opportunistic. It will grow anywhere. Um, it grows on the sides of the roads. It grows in sumps. It can grow in fresh water and in brackish water. So it grows right up to the water's edge while the cattails need fresh water. So even if they didn't have those brown uh, seed heads, the leaves of the um, cattail go from bottom to top. So if you look in this picture, you can't see a stem with leaves because there isn't one. The leaves all come from a single point at the bottom. On the Phragmites on the right-hand picture though, with the feathery tops, you can see the leaves. There's a stem with leaves coming out. And that's a way to tell, even if you were to, to see this, um, if you look down and see how it's growing, you can sort of tell the difference. Um, Phragmites are actually uh, introduced. They've been here a very long time, but they were not native um, to Fire Island or Long Island. They were brought here from Europe. And uh, because they are so adaptable, it's good for them, but not so good for the cattails. So we, cattails seem to be, um, the patches of cattails get smaller and smaller. So some of the animals you might see when you're in the forest. Um, if you're really quiet, if you go down the trail, um, you might see that white-tailed deer that's sleeping in the forest. Um, I've put pictures of two snakes here because we see these in the sunken forest more than we see them anywhere else. And you have to sort of be quiet. They're on the ground underneath the boardwalk. But um, this one in the upper left is a garter snake, okay? We have, um, we have them all over Long Island too. Um, they grow to two to three feet, the eastern garter snake come in sort of different colors. The one on the right is more particular to Fire Island, and this is a black racer. So a northern black racer grows to four to five feet long. Neither of these are venomous. They will run away from you quicker than you can run away from them. Um, I did one day on the trail see a catbird chasing a black racer, which I thought was pretty wonderful. It must have gotten too close to the nest, but it was very bravely chasing this snake as it went away. And um, the lower right, this is a, an eastern box turtle. And these are um, probably you'd see a box turtle before you'd see a deer or a snake. They don't move that fast. Um, you hear the rustling. You hear the rustling in the leaves. Uh, but um, they're very well camouflaged. They are freshwater. Uh, they're called box turtles. Now, people always say, our, our, I thought tortoises were the ones on land and turtles were the one in the water. Um, it's not always so. It, it's a taxonomical thing with the way their bones are put inside their shells, but uh, they are actually a turtle, but they are freshwater. Um, and we, we, you probably see them on Long Island as well. Um, when you hear this rustling on the forest floor, if it's not a box turtle. It could very well be either one of these birds. So in the summer, these birds are um, pretty obvious, unless you're making a huge racket. So the one on the top is an eastern towhee. 
So we say Toei, it's sort of what it say, the sound it makes, and it's spelled T-O-W-H-E-E, Tohi. Uh, but they are very distinctive. Um, you might think it's a robin at first when you see it on the forest floor, it's about that size, until you see that white breast it's got. And um, the catbird is the second one here. The gray catbird is very common. Um, they're common here on Long Island as well. And they're not very shy. Um, they have a uh, black cap, if you can see it in the picture, and it's sort of rusty red underneath their tail, but it's, um, it's related to the mockingbird. So it's one of these birds that sort of flicks its tail up and down as it's sitting there. They also eat insects, um, and you'll see them on the forest floor. In the spring especially, we see loads of warblers. There are many, many species. I don't pretend to be able to tell the difference, except for this one. And this is a yellow warbler. And it looks like a little tiny canary almost. They are very, very yellow. And you do see them. And even if you just caught a glimpse at the corner of your eye, you'd know what this one is because it's yellow. It's the only really, really yellow bird uh, that you'll see uh, flying around in the forest. Though there's, there's other birds there. There's warblers of different kinds. There are red starts, which are sort of an orangey red warbler with black wings. Um, lots of other birds there. And it's, again, we could, we could have a hundred more slides with the birds here. Um, but as you come out of the forest, um, this is sort of the west entrance of uh, the sunken forest. And you come out into the swale. So the swale is this sort of hot, dry area. If you notice, We've moved sort of from forest to bare sand and um, some low-lying plants. And those low-lying plants are, um, are designed for survival in a very hot, dry environment. Um, at this time of year, well, not yet. Um, in probably May, these yellow plants that are close to the ground are beech heather and um, it's, you'll see them all over Fire Island, these sort of low little lumps that are green and um, the leaves are very tight to the stem in order to conserve water and to protect them from the sun. There is a sidewalk or a cement pathway uh, through the swale um, uh, in front of, I guess you call it, south of the sunken forest. So you can see the forest to the right uh, in the second picture with this, um, this cement walkway. So it's really hot in here. If you come to the sunken forest in the summer, um, there is a loop. You can walk through the forest, then walk back to the visitor center along this trail. But if it's a hot day, you want to turn around and go through the forest again because there's not much shade here. Um, and it's, war it's warmer than everywhere else or you need a big hat. And here are some of these plants. Um, this is the beech heather on the left, and this is it in bloom. It's quite beautiful, um, but sort of the plain green or greenish gray is what we see most of the rest of the year. Um, on the upper right is bayberry, and you may have smelt a bayberry candle. It is related to the kind of laurel that we use for bay leaves you know, in cooking. So you could actually throw a, bay, a bayberry leaf in your spaghetti sauce to add that kind of flavor. The candles are made from these berries. And if you notice, they're white and they're, they're very waxy. If you, if you see them in person, it's, it's clear. They're not a juicy berry like a, um, a holly berry even, but they're very, they're tiny. They're, they're eighth of an inch, uh, diameter and um, the birds eat them. So you could not eat them. They're inedible. They are very, very, they have this waxy coating on them. And the, um, the barn swallows that we see eating mosquitoes all summer long in the fall before they migrate, they switch and they eat bayberry because it has this wax is a really dense lipid, gives them lots of energy for their migration. And then the other picture is a beach plum. And this is a very well-kept secret. If you've been to Fire Island and you know about it, you would collect them to make jam. They're a little bit tart, 
Uh, they ripen usually just around Labor Day. And of course the deers, rabbit, birds all eat them, but they're, it's like a cherry sized tart plum and they're kind of neat. And you might also see some wildlife in the swale. So um, there's a family of white-tailed deer and there is a red fox. So if you're doing the whole tour, you could walk um, out to the beach. So any time of year, you can't go wrong with um, picnicking on the beach or beach combing. Um, but this is our walkway out to the ocean beach. So um, I'll take questions now. I think we are pretty good on time because there's a short video I wanted to show you that talk about that talks about the science um, of the sunken forest. But um, any questions up to this point? Well, so far in the chat, uh, back when we were talking about poison ivy, someone was uh, wondering, do the deer eat poison ivy? Yes, they do. Um, deer don't need to um, drink water. Be deer, in general, get all the water they need from the vegetation, from these nice, juicy uh, poison ivy leaves. Yes, so the deer do eat it. And I saw the comment in there, I just took a look, poison, uh, beach plum brandy, yes. There's somebody who really knows how to take advantage of beach plums, beach plum jam and beach plum brandy. Yes, indeed. Um, any other questions up to this point? All right, so we're gonna see. Um, okay, I'm gonna see, I'm gonna unplug my ear plugs and play this and give me a thumbs up if you can. Can everybody hear it? Just needs to be slightly louder if you can. Okay. Um, okay. I'm not sure I can make it louder. I've got it as loud as it goes on here. Um, I don't know. Hang on. Give it a try and let's see what we can hear. Okay. Take a in Sunken Forest and Fire Island to see how this leaves will be this The Sunken Forest is one of only two historic maps and old photos and headed off. But the island is only accessible by boat. I know absolutely everything about this map. What I fantasized about being there. Pat, the audio is very hard to hear. It's it's muted, but maybe you can okay. talk, maybe you can talk us through it. Um I you know it's really good if you could hear it. I'm gonna Stop sharing so I can adjust my volume. As, there we go. Okay. Let's see if this is any better. Okay. Can you hear it? No, it's very muted. It must be a setting for the meeting, and unfortunately, I can't change any of the settings. I'm sorry. Okay. No, that's all right. Let's just enjoy the view, 
and then I'll talk about it afterwards. How's that? Okay. The dunes almost completely obscure the view of the forest from the ocean. The canopies are cleared by subtle air from within the Atlantic, so the leaves don't get covered in the sand. In fall, we can run deeper into the forest and get nearly to the floor of the Pacific and Pacific Ocean. This place is a little bit of a lot of the same thing. Before we ran over to the fields, we sat to the visitor center, which is the usual thing. Okay, what they're talking about now is the um, how the forest is disappearing. That they're saying 40% of the forest has disappeared um, since the 60s when Hank Art first started doing um, research here. So there's been continuous research. The plots are still there um, in the forest where, um, where scientists have been studying the vegetation especially. This is another area where the boardwalk had to be re-diverted because of erosion here. So this used to be a, a lookout. Erosion, worsened by docks and marinas, has really reshaped the edges of the forest. Jordan pointed out its old silhouette on an aerial image that the Army Corps of Engineers took back in the 30s. As forest boundaries are washed away, the land is pinched. It keeps getting narrower and narrower. Climate change is a main culprit too, but in some surprising ways. When you think of rising water, maybe you picture waves drowning a shoreline. But in the sunken forest, sea level rise is doing something else. Oh, wow, there's so much water down there. Yeah, so you can see that when we're talking about the water table impacting the trees, it's really close to the surface. Yeah. These have always been here, but uh, they don't quite drain like they used to. Mm. We'll have water that will be standing here after a rain for quite some time. And even when it doesn't rain, there'll be standing water in here. And that's from the water table, again, just getting pushed up. So what he's talking about is sea level rise is causing the water table to rise and it's basically drowning the trees. Seawater isn't breaching the dunes and sloshing into the woods. Instead, as the land erodes, the whole water table is rising. There have always been slow draining patches in the woods. But now there's a lot of standing fresh water in places where there wasn't before. And those swampy pools are causing the trees around them to rot and die. So a lot of these ticks carry different pathogens that could make you sick, one being Lyme disease. So we don't want any of our staff, and especially you, getting Lyme disease. Shrinking land and rising water are big problems for the forest. But there's another menace that's also causing a lot of trouble. To get a closer look, we had to venture off the boardwalk. The threat is eating the forest to death. And it's pretty cute. It's the deer. Fire Island is full of them. And unfortunately for the sunken forest, they've got an appetite for American holly. Some parts of the forest have been fenced off, so deer can't get to them. It's easy to compare those areas to the rest of the woods, where there's an obvious graze line. It's at the deer's mouth level, and below it, the animals have picked almost everything clean. This is a good example of new growth of a holly that a deer has not been able to get to. So it does have a natural defense once it's able to get established because it's holly and it's got all these thorns. Mm -hmm. um, but when it pops out new growth, again, it's impacted by anything that's in the browse line, uh, a deer will nip it off right away. So is that why these lower branches are empty? Yep. You can see, see all the browsing here? Look at all that browsing. See each part. So he's talking about how the deer have basically eaten all of the holly that's at their level. There's, there's some new growth here that hasn't been eaten yet. But pretty much all of it. Boom, 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 anything. The deer eat the soft new leaves, which means that young plants get gobbled up and there's not much fresh growth in the forest. 
plants are being nibbled faster than there are new ones to take their place. In the areas where the deer are banished, though, the forest is thicker. It's lush, it's green, it's full of new growth. The forest won't be around forever. Jordan says it's hard to say how long it has. Maybe 25 years, maybe 50, maybe 100, maybe more. Though the island is taking some steps to curb the deer population, they haven't found a way to shore up the bay against erosion or to stop the water table from rising. It's just a matter of time. Climate change will drive people from their homes, reshape cities, and cause blooms of disease. Many of those impacts will be huge and massively visible. But the sunken forest is a reminder that some destruction will be subtle, chipping away at beautiful, unsung places before many people even know that they're there to begin with. Today, you can't see the forest from the beach. Eventually, no matter where you stand, there won't be much forest left to see at all. Thanks so much for watching. Subscribe to our channel to check out more awesome videos and hop into the comments. Okay. Welcome back in. Well, I'm sorry that you couldn't hear. Um, I'm sorry that you couldn't hear that, but um, we could, um, excuse me, Pat, we could hear some of that towards okay. you. Yes. Um, we did have one question. If you could review back while they were getting, while they were preparing themselves to enter the forest, um, mm -hmm. we were curious to know why hands can't be exposed. If you could talk about the toxicity that they might have experienced. Um, they were covering themselves up so they could, wouldn't get ticks on them. Um, that yes, when our researchers go into the woods, they wear those white Tyvek suits and big boots and duct tape, and it's for ticks. So that's a good question. Let me look at the chat questions. Yeah, so it's not the hands. It's um, let's see. The question I was asking was why weren't the hands covered? Um, because it didn't seem like they covered their hands, but they covered their, you know, their other areas. Right. It was, uh, thank you. Thank you for clarifying. Um, it, it's really for the ticks, um, getting on their clothing and on their body. I guess on your hands, you could, as long as you have some tape here, you can still use your hands and, and check for ticks. I feel so guilty someone I brought into our lives did you hear? Uh -oh. Jerry, did you have? Oh, okay, go ahead. There. Um, so, other questions? I, I, uh, I'm glad you could hear at least some of that video. It's really interesting that um, the research started in the 60s and it continues in the same exact spots. We have maps and lots of those. Um, study areas are underwater and sea level rise is is causing these uh pools of fresh water which which kill the trees so any questions <laughs> somebody said where can i purchase beach plum brandy <laughs> I think it's something that you make at home. All right then, um, that's it. I hope people have been inspired to come and actually walk through the forest. I know the video, even if you couldn't hear it very well, gave you a little sense of walking through it, uh, maybe a little more than the, the photos did. When is the best time to visit the forest, would you say? Um, spring is good, um, but really all year round. It's one of the nice spots where you can go in the heat of the summer and you're shaded, you're in the shade. Um, the downside of that is in July and August, the mosquitoes come. Mm -hmm. So I, maybe I'd say June um, before the mosquitoes get really bad, but always bring a bottle of some kind of bug spray with you because they can be, you can't outrun them in there. <laughs> it's sometimes the mosquitoes can be pretty bad. Mm -hmm. And are you, 
Are you familiar? Are the fairies running yet to the forest? And also, not yet. Are, not yet. Okay. No. And is there ever that. is there camping in and around that area? No, there's not. Um, there is camping on Fire Island. There is a campground at Watch Hill, and there's uh, backcountry camping where there's no campsites, but that's just in our wilderness area. So that's between um, sort of Watch Hill, east of Watch Hill, and east to where the breach is. You can, you can camp. The ferries should start running in May. Um, the Sa I gave the link for the Sable Ferries, but it's something you can Google, the ferry to Sailor's Haven. And year round, you can go, you can go to Sayville and take a ferry to Cherry Grove, which is just um, maybe three quarters of a mile walk uh, west to the Sunken Forest. So it's, it's really accessible year round. Mm -hmm. And can you repeat one more time how wide and long Fire Island actually is? Sure. It's 32 miles long and less than a half mile wide. So there's places where it's much less than half mile wide. Um, but that's, I mean, that's the nature of a barrier island. It's long and skinny. Mm -hmm. Very good. And we're getting some feedback. Um, we want to keep these sessions going and they're having great fun learning about the science of our community. That's great. Thank you for saying that because we are trying to keep these going. <laughs> we, um, in fact, I'll do a little plug right now while I have your attention. Our next, the next time Pat will be joining us will be next month, next Wednesday, April 14th, again at seven o'clock. Um, and we're going to talk all about piping plovers. So I'm looking forward to that one. And so be sure to check our newsletter, uh, sign up for our emails, um, but that's going to be April 14th. And our registration will begin towards the end of March as our newsletters get going out to the mailboxes. And we're, we're working on May and we're working on June. So we're, we're keeping it coming. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And if you go to, um, it's uh, www. Oh boy, um, NPS. Gov slash F I I S, um, and I can put it in the chat box. Uh, there's a lot more information about Fire Island and um, our calendar of events is there, you can sort of get lost on that website. There's so much information there uh, about the sunken forest. There's little videos embedded in there and, um, and see what programs we've got, what kind of tours, and they'll, you'll get an idea of when the visitor centers will be open. That's great. Do we have any one any more questions? I think we're we're good. We'll wrap it up. Thank you all for attending. Thank you, Pat, again for a very interesting and informative uh, tour of Fire Island. I loved it. Um, so I look forward to seeing everybody uh, next next month. Have a good night, everyone. Okay. Thank good you, night. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Really enjoyed it. Thank You're you. very welcome. See you at the beach. Thank you. Sounds good. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.